talk about. Hi, folks. This is uh, Richard Hall here from Stonehenge Aotearoa, and uh, looking at our southern night sky at the moment. Okay, so. What's uh, happening at the moment? Well, just to point out that we've got some billion uh, different things happening here in the um, down at Stonehenge, a whole series of different productions and uh, special evenings. And coming up in the not too distant future, we've got a, a, uh, a program by Keith Austin, who's one of our local musicians, but he's also a keen astronomer. And uh, he's going to be doing a very special presentation and also sound effects on pulsars. So that's coming up in on in later in August on Sat uh, on Saturday, the August the twenty seventh. Right. So that's what we've got coming up. But the other thing that we have we've been having quite regularly out at Stonehenge is musical evenings as well. Uh, this is always the normally the last Thursday of the uh, the month. All right. And for those of you watching this on TV, you can see Stefan there and a few of the other uh, musicians there. Uh, and we've also got things like uh, the Lord of the Rings coming up, Saturn, it comes to its closest to the Earth as well. So got a, quite a few things happening there at the moment. Anyway. Better tell them what date that is. Yes, well, we can do we can do that at the end. The the which one you're talking about? The Saturn. You didn't say what day. No, no. We'll, I'll do I'll do that at the end. Sorry, Kay. Yeah. Okay. Just to point out that we're open on weekends from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. All right. And because uh, these are the these are the winter hours at the moment. Anyway. Yippee! And also, uh, I'd like to point out that we've got. Uh, uh, some amazing discoveries have just been made recently and one of them of course is that around the nearest star which is Proxima Centauri uh, they discovered a planet and furthermore this planet is um, just at the right position and just the right mass to have liquid water at its surface so it looks like another earth, to earth that's been discovered there but Proxima is about 20,000 times fainter than our sun so if you lived on this planet uh, I think a day a year lasts for about five days or something like that as it whizzes around all right so that's what we've what we've discovered just recently so that's Proxima anyway um, I wanted to talk about the uh, James Webb deep field. Um, there have been lots of photographs coming out of, of recent times and um, there's beautiful pictures coming from this big space telescope going out and uh, but often there's no, very little explanation. And uh, this is the, what they call the deep field, looking at the most distant part in the universe we've ever looked at. This is at 13.1 billion light years away, all right? So in other words, you're, with the images you're seeing started on its journey to us more than 13 billion years ago. Now that's long, long before the solar system, the Earth, was ever born. All right? And when you look at a picture like this, it's actually very few, there's only a small number of stars actually in that image there. All those other little dots you see, and, and they're actually galaxies, like our Milky Way galaxy, each of them containing something like, you know, 100, 200, thousand million stars. Right? When and people look at that, Richard, there are some that look like little lines, little curvy lines. Um, are you going to talk about those? Because they look as if somebody made a mistake with a camera, yeah, but I, they're not. What we're, what we're often looking at is sometimes edge-on galaxies, what we're looking at. Yeah, yeah, but some of them are actually gravitational lens, and don't dist they? Distortions. If yeah. you look there, you can see in certain areas where the, everything is seems to be uh, bent in a certain pattern around a certain area. And these undoubtedly probably due to massive uh, gravitational fields, possibly giant black holes. So you're actually seeing something that's behind what you're looking at, yeah. but you're, it's distorted, it's pictures distorted. Mm. And they use this fancy... Computational, com computational software to undistort it so that they can see what it looks like. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. so but I so say it's for the average person is just a pretty picture, but there's in fact enormous amounts of information in this, and so we're looking at that. Of course, the question is, is where did the universe come from? We talk about the Big Bang, everything appearing at the same moment, uh, just over 13 billion e years ago. You know. Uh, but is our universe just part of an infinite number of other universes and so on? These are some of the things we're looking at at the moment. So lots of amazing discoveries may, being made there at the moment. Okay. Oh, here's another 
beautiful photograph for those who look at it. This is the Southern Ring Nebula. And of course, it, they're not pretty pictures to the average person, but for astronomers, these are rather, uh, rather special. I remember donkeys years ago looking at the Ring Nebula in a small telescope and seeing photographs of it, but it's the amount of detail that you can see. And the, this, this object is actually going to the other end. It's actually a dying star. Uh, when our sun gets towards the end of its life, um, it will turn into what we call a red giant. It will expand in size. And then as it begins to die, it will begin to eject its outer layers into space. And it becomes a, what we call a planetary nebula. And that's exactly what we're looking at here. It's the death of a star. And what's left at the centre is the white hot core where all the nuclear reactions used to take place. And that just cool, eventually will cool, starts off as white hot but eventually it will cool down to become a solid object. Yeah, Yeah. when you look at the ring, you see that like, what looks like a clear blue sky in there. That's actually this, where it's blasted all the stuff away. And when you're looking at the ring, that's all the stuff that's been blasted away. And on this particular image from Webb, it's so clear that you can actually see how when you're looking at something that's like a looking at a bullet hole, really, from the other side, mm. you know. Well, the things that you often find is here looking at the rings you'll begin to see different colors and and different and this is because as a star evolves over time it starts off just as a like a ball of hydrogen and helium but then gradually it structures out as as hydrogen and helium is then in thermo, thermonuclear reactions is turned into another compound it slowly changes and um and so you end up with these layers and then, of course, when the star dies, it throws all these different layers out. And these layers are made of different elements. And, of course, they, they uh, reflect or transmit colours, different colours and so on. So that, again, is what we're, we're seeing when we look at this. So that's the Southern Ring Nebula. OK. Another one of the other wonderful photographs is actually taken right down here in New Zealand. Um, we've got this um, beautiful nebula, which we call the Carina Nebula. It's too far south for people to see in in the, in the uh, northern hemisphere, but it is the biggest and brightest nebula in the sky, thousands and thousands of light years away. It is a major place where new uh, stars are forming. Yeah, Carina's the keel of the ship of the Argonauts, isn't it? Yeah. But it's been divided up into different constellations. So yeah. when you look at the keel all by itself. That's a Carina nebula, yeah. Now, to the, to, to, to the unaided eye, if you go out at night, you'll actually see the Carina nebula. And later, later I'll show you where it is exactly in the sky. Um, and it just looks like a hazy patch of light, which you can see from a dark sky. Then there's a beautiful photograph taken by telescopes that you can see at the top. But when we look at the James Webb telescope, it's looking much, much closer and much greater detail. And you can see the little tiny square, oblong square down the bottom there. That's where all the other photographs have been taken. So let's try and bring that photograph up there. All right. OK, no, it's not. We'll have to do that later on. OK, <laughs> OK. Well, what we'll do is we'll have a short break now, folks, have a little bit of music and then we'll come back and we'll have a look at the night sky.
Hi folks, you're, you're back here with uh, Richard at the looking at the night sky and uh, I just get uh, to, well, the picture that came up earlier is actually taken from one of our music evenings showing you some of the wonderful musicians that we actually have been having there and so on. Yeah, so remember that last Thursday of the month. Anyway, looking at our night sky at the moment, looking to the north and there's I put some snowy mountains there as well. The winter night skies are probably the most fabulous night skies because the reason for that is the most brilliant region of the Milky Way comes directly overhead. So there's the stars that we're looking at at the moment, but there's actually another star there which isn't shown. Well, we'll bring that up. That's where the arrow is. There's another bright star there. Well, that's not a star. That's the planet Saturn. All right. And until just recently all the big bright planets have been in the morning sky but they're now moving into the evening sky here we see saturn and later in the month it's going to be joined by jupiter will be up there as well and saturn is of course one of the most fabulous objects to look at uh, in the sky there it is beautiful photographs and that the orientation of the rings that we see uh, vary as we move around move around the sun we see it sometimes almost edge on and so on and uh, because Saturn during uh, August is coming the earth is making its closest approach to Saturn it's the best time to actually observe it and we're be going to be putting on a special program at Stonehenge just about uh, Saturn itself and what we're going to be looking at we're going to have a special presentation looking at the this awesome planet which has got something like in the region of 90 moons. It's, uh, it's like a solar system on its own. Uh, and then hopefully, if it's nice and clear, we're going to be taking you out and we can, uh, we can go out and have a look at it through one of the telescopes there. So that's all going to be starting. The program will start at 5 o'clock on Saturday, August the 20th. So it's 5 o'clock, Saturday, August the 20th. And that's near sundown, so people can go out and see the sunset at Stonehenge. Then we'll have the special presentation and then hopefully take you out to have a look through those telescopes. Right. So that's what's coming up at the moment. But you should, if you'd be able to go out to uh, at night, you should be able to pick that um, Saturn out. And is that like a horn of stars that you can see there? And that horn of stars is actually the constellation of Capricorn that we can see there. There's Capricorn coming up now for those of you watching this on TV. OK, so that's Saturn in our evening sky at the moment. But the most spectacular region, of course, it comes directly overhead. And here we've got the... Um, beautiful constellation of the scorpion to the, Poly uh, to the Polynesians of course it was the fish hook of Maui all right that fished up the lands all right and indeed Kay if you coming from from the north you could it's around the other way isn't it and it does sort of rise up over the land yeah, yeah if you were sailing if you were sailing in the direction that Scorpius is rising or the scorpion is rising you wouldn't be able to see it for a while, but as you sailed in that direction, it would lift up over the horizon. If there happened to be a landmass there, it would look as if it was fishing it out of the sea. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And it, and once you it's picked out, it's a spectacular group of stars, which is very very easy to recognise. The brightest star, and indeed the brightest star, is Antares. And even with the unaided eye, you can see that it's got a definite reddish glow to it. You see, stars uh, are all different temperatures and therefore the predominant radiation varies. Our sun is a yellow star. The hottest stars are blue stars and white hot stars. Cooler stars are yellow and orange. So, uh, But the thing is, the, sh the ability for the human eye to see colours depends upon the brightness. Right? So just looking at... Uh, the stars at night there's not enough light normally coming to trigger the cone cells in your eyes which give you colored vision you're just really seeing it in black and white but if you look for a telescope on the other hand bam suddenly there's enough light coming through it and you begin to see the colors of the stars with the antares is so bright that you can begin to see it's definitely a reddish orange colored star isn't it Kay? you know it is once your eyes get used to it. I remember when Richard first told me these things, I thought it was emperor with no clothes. I couldn't see any difference. <laughs> so if you find that, don't be put off. It is a little bit more getting used to looking at the night sky. Your brain adjusts and notices the difference. Yeah. Now look at Antares. It's a red-orange star. It's a long, long way away, but it's cooler than the sun. 
that tells you that this thing must be a pretty big star and indeed it is it is a, a what we call a super giant star all right well imagine standing on a standing on the surface of a planet uh, this one i've just shown you for the spews at home wouldn't be very nice to stand on well uh, antares is actually 605 light years away and when you take that into account it's actually 65,000 times brighter than the sun. It's equal to 65,000 suns. But not only that, as I just mentioned earlier, because it's a red star, its surface area has to be a lot larger to produce that amount of radiation. Indeed, it has a, a diameter of 800 kilometers. So why is it cooler when it's so big? Well, it wasn't originally. What's happening is that originally this was been a hot blue star, and as it's aged, it's 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 throws off its outer layers begin to expand outwards so that's what we're seeing now but only the biggest chart stars turning into these oh it's gr gradually dying this yeah, star. It it's in this mm. large stages of its life there yeah and i think i've got there it comes this little for watching it on tv see the little white dot that's come up that would be the sun to scale if you put next to antares so our sun's a pretty big star incidentally so they mustn't put our sun down but to, c compared to Antares, it's tiny. And indeed, if you if you were to put Antares where the sun is, all of the planets out to it, including Mars, would be inside that sun. All right? So this is a t colossal mm. star. Well, one of the beautiful things that when you look at Antares through the telescope, it's orange, but it's got a companion star, which you can only see in the telescope, and it appears green. Yeah, it's a green star. There you are there. And that's called Antares B, and it orbits around the big brighter star in a period of about 900 years. Does it just appear green because it's got a big red thing next to it? In part, it, what happens is it's actually a hot star, white, bluey, bluey white star, but because of the red of Antares, it accentuates the, the green light coming from the star. Yeah, because, yeah, so, and when you look at the colours of different stars, there isn't a green one. No, we but I tell you what, I mean, I remember looking at that through a telescope, you know, and it looks like a... It does a, look green. Yeah, yeah, a big ruby with a little emerald, emerald beside of it. Mm. It's quite an amazing thing. But eventually, as, as Kay's already mentioned out, these are a star in the last stages of its life. And, of course, what will happen eventually, this star will explode because it doesn't just die weakly. Giant stars like this die in violent eruptions called a supernova. And I tell you what, when that happens, it's going to be more than visible in the broad daylight. And we just hope that 600 light years is far enough away when this thing explodes. Yeah. So there you are. And Mind you, if it takes 600, 600 years to get to us, it may have already exploded. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, that's, that, of course, that's right. Yeah. Hello. So, so you wouldn't know about it for a while. <laughs> 600 years to find out. Yes. Hang on. We, we've got a problem here there you are there yeah. well I'm virtually found my way back again there you are well that the, the scorpion clings around the uh, the Milky Way the brightest region of the Milky Way and actually when we look at this bright region we're looking towards galactic center now galactic center does not lay in Scorpio it lays in actually the neighboring constellation of uh, Sagittarius right and just look at where the arrow of Sagittarius is roughly where the arrow is I think I've got a little star there you are that's marking for those of you watching this on TV you can see exactly where galactic center is but I must point out to you you cannot see galactic center those dark clouds that you can see up in the sky there right there it's not there's no stars there as our ancestors used to think it's because there's cosmic clouds of dust and gas which are simply blotting out the light of the nearby uh, uh, other stars that are closer to us and also uh, you can see that bright region of the Milky Way that's how bright it should even be brighter than that out there uh, the galactic center is literally tens of thousands of light years away right? and um, here we've got, I've got a photograph taken actually from Stonehenge and you can we'll bring that up a little bit closer looking towards galactic center and ne near galactic center is the cosmic keyway now, can you see the kiwi there yeah yeah it's just got his beak dark beak yeah there, there he is there okay yeah. easy to pick out the cosmic it's not an official constellation it's just not being named by kiwis surprisingly enough and when you're looking up there where that's where the star shows that's towards galactic center there right 
and that's where, and we know galactic center there for a long time ago because up until recently you've got these very powerful radio uh signals coming from there very powerful and because it was so far away you knew something big was out there right? isn't it thirty three thousand light years away something like that I'll just put it up here now yeah. We've measured it precisely in the web it's twenty six thousand six hundred and seventy three ah. light years away and here we can actually see a photograph of it and what it what you've actually got there is a titanic black hole a truly enormous black hole which is eating other stars and planets at the rate of a solar system per year and that's where the radio noise comes from right so that's what we're actually looking at this is a real big monster there if you could see it all right don't want to get near this it's called Sagittarius A and it's got a the black hole's got a mass equal to four four million one hundred and fifty thousand times the mass of the entire solar system all right so this is a monster and indeed this is not unusual because what we discovered at the center the nucleus of every big galaxy there is a giant black hole is that what's holding the galaxy together it may have well be what's actually the seed of the galaxy itself so these black holes may have formed at the very earliest of times and then matter has swirled and began to swirl around them which then uh turned into stars and like going down a plug hole basically yeah, exactly yeah mm. so that's what we know about that yeah so there's sagittarius a anyway look i've got some of these pictures coming to spot that we were talking about earlier that uh, we'll move on from there and there's that carina nebula we we're looking at earlier and here's that photograph i was going to show you and here it is here it's called the cosmic cliffs but remember that's just a teeny weeny part of that beautiful ne nebula in Carina. And there's the Southern Ring Nebula, and we've got the other ones there at the moment. Anyway, uh, just to finish off by saying that uh, we're open on weekends from 10 o'clock to 4 pm, which is our, our winter times at the moment. Uh, but throughout, throughout the uh, month, we invariably putting on other programs for you, special programs for people to come out and have a look at. And I'm, I've mentioned some of these earlier on. This coming Thursday at 6.30 p.m. we got Stars and Stones. All right? That's this coming Thursday at 6.30. Come out and uh, we're going to have a special program all about the winter night sky. And then hopefully we'll take you out with a laser. Uh, I've got a laser and I'll take you out and we'll find our way across the night sky. You can learn the stars themselves. All right? So that's starting at 6.30 this coming Thursday. Okay. Then we've got Saturn, Lord of the Rings, which I've just mentioned because we're coming at the closest point to Saturn. We're hopefully you'll be able to look through a telescope. And I'll tell you what, I, people get absolutely stunned when they look at this thing through a telescope. Well, that's all going to be happening at 5 p.m. on Saturday, August the 20th. So later in the month, 5 p.m. Saturday, August the 20th. Uh, if you want to know more details, of course, you can always give us a phone at Stonehenge. And if you want to come, it's, it's always, always advisable to book your position because there's always with these things, with this telescope view and there's limited numbers. And you can it, book yourself in going through the website. Okay. Right. Okay, so that's www.stonehenge-atera.nz. Yeah. Then we've got the Music Club, which is on uh, the last Thursday month. The next one coming up is 7 o'clock on Thursday, August the 25th. OK. And finally, uh, pulsars, that special thing about those things. And because what happens when a star, we looked at Antares before, and then it explodes into a supernova. And what's left at the centre of the core is actually a pulsar. And these things are absolutely amazing. I'm not going to say more about them, but they're mind-bending objects. And we were going to be having a special program of them at 7 o'clock on Saturday, August the Wasn't it a woman who actually found yeah. the pulsar? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's right, yeah. Right. Yeah, and her boss tried to claim credit, but it... <laughs> that's, that's right. <laughs> a male boss, but she things, she found it. Things yeah. haven't changed much, have they? No. 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 And this is, incidentally, is the evening of the Phoenix Astronomical Society. It's got their meeting at that, and that's the main presentation at that meeting. And you're all welcome to come along on that uh, free of charge, okay? Well, having said that, uh, go out and have a look at that night sky and... Uh, I'll leave you with it.